Hey folks, Carolyn here to tell you just a little bit about the Games and Online Harassment Hotline. It's a free text message based confidential emotional support hotline that was created specifically for the gaming community. So whether you're a player, a developer, a streamer, a competitor, any part of the gaming community, the hotline is here for you, ready to provide emotional support or help finding the referrals and resources that you may need. Visit gameshotline.org for more information. This film, I I loved every minute of it, but there was a certain little nugget of anxiety um, that I carried throughout because we are so accustomed to um, seeing like trauma um, perpetrated against queer people on screen that I was just waiting for it. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined by two women who were definitely just out at the movies until 3 a.m. Carolyn Pettit. Hey, hey. And Ebony Adams. The movie ran late. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't I know wish. I was going to a Lord of the Rings movie marathon. <laughs> I thought, But when you accept a movie invitation from me, that's probably a safe bet. Fair, yeah, yeah. Now and I lesson Hobbit. learned. Lesson learned. All, and the Hobbit series all in no, one. Oh, no, good Lord. I would not. No, I would not. Include no. <laughs> Come no, on. Here. Don't you know Let's anything? Let's not be ridiculous, Anita. Too much? Too much? All right. Well, much. this week we're kicking off a month of episodes focusing on films by black creators with a conversation about D. Reese's 2011 direct Tutorial shave you. <laughs> oh boy. Pariah, stay tuned. Now, in Anita's defense, she has been off for the past two weeks. So words like directorial, you know, are, are ch- <laughs> you have to warm up the, the mouth muscles and everything. Get That's used right. to saying those five syllable words again. So Welcome. Do you miss having a cast member who can't pronounce anything? Did you miss that? <laughs> well, welcome back. Yes, we did. Anita. We did, but in, welcome in back. Our, we I missed mean, you. As longtime listeners know, in our scripts, they Carolyn and Ebony literally write phonetically <laughs> words that they know I'm going to mess up mm. because but I mean, I'm that, terrible. Pe- people do that for other folks, Anita. Like, you are by no means the only person. You know, who needs like phonetic spellings for things. I, so, you know, feel good I about appreciate yourself. you making me uh, feel better, even though I still find it very embarrassing. Listen, it's yeah, fine. you could have primed the old podcast pump before you jumped on, but we'll get there <laughs> by like the wrap up. We should be fine. Yeah. Um, How are you two doing? I'm tired of sale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You should take a break, too. Huh. Yeah, I should. You want to talk to I- everybody asking for things? <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah so uh so yeah oh good news um it looks like um team liquid won their tournament and so um they chose the games and online harassment hotline you know as their charity to support and uh we are just incredibly incredibly grateful for that shout out and for the donation that's coming our way they're helping us do incredible incredible work so yeah man this happened well so i was off for two weeks and like (laughs) i literally near the beginning ebony's like hey i got a thing i was like i don't care don't care not talking to anyone and then (laughs) it turns out it was something she should (laughs) have cared about but you know i'm like the um henny penny you never know when what i'm telling you is an actual emergency it's true henny penny (laughs) that i'm thinking of well you cried well whatever y'all listen the point is anita knows when not to pay attention to my whatsapp messages it's true. Anyways, but so I got back and um, so Team Liquid is a League of Legends uh, esports team and they won the like pre championship or their pre season champions. Um, I don't I don't know how things work. And uh, and Riot is donating um, money to the nonprofit of the team's choice. And we were their choice. And that's super exciting. And what a lovely thing to come back to work learning. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thanks, y'all. I really appreciate it. Um, it's going and it's going to the hotline specifically. Yeah, just to be clear. Um, and yeah, it is not going us- to me if you were working. <laughs> <laughs> Which was what I tried shit. to arrange. I yeah. tried to arrange it. I was like, listen, y'all, just you know, write me the check. I'll make sure Anita gets it. Well, I but, just um, mean it's not going to this stupid podcast. It's actually going to help. Yeah, people. but maybe if someone gave us, you know, a bunch of money, the podcast wouldn't be so stupid anymore. You That's know? true. That's true. I mean, like if someone wants to write us a giant check, I will definitely take time off from my full time job. But hey, do a little more prep. 
think about all of our patrons who donate to us enjoying our stupid or well, I guess we shouldn't use that word, but enjoying enjoying what we do here at Feminist Frequency, mm-hmm. words and all. Yeah, it can't all, all be hate listens, right? It, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I'm very sad to have missed the episode about Promising Young Woman. Mm. Um, and I don't actually know what you all said, but holy shit, I would have. I already talked Carolyn's ear off about it. <laughs> but well, we can damn. we can talk about it in the bonus. Yeah, you know, maybe. We can have an extra long bonus. Um, maybe. But, all right. Uh, but yeah. Well, let's get into this. With the release of her acclaimed film Mudbound in 2017, Dee Rees reached new levels of fame and also became the first black woman ever to be nominated in the Best Adapted Screenplay category at the Academy Awards. But six years prior, in 2011, she'd released a low-budget independent film that had announced her as a major talent. That film was Pariah, the story of a young black lesbian named Aliki living in Brooklyn and struggling to assert herself and live her truth, even as her parents make it painfully clear that they will not accept that their daughter is gay. Described by Reese as semi-autobiographical, the film vibrates with authenticity as it captures the anguish and the joy of Aliki's efforts to live an authentic life. Like, I don't even know how to describe to somebody who hasn't seen this film what makes it feel so authentic, but you just, like... it. You just know watching this or you just feel watching this film like you are getting just an honest window into Mm -hmm. a world of experience that is true, like that is true and that is real. And it's so complex and multifaceted and human and all the, the whole range of emotions are, you know, are there. And I mean, you know, I have to give tremendous credit not only to Dee Reese, but to um, Adaparo Oduye, who plays oh. Alike, uh, who is just phenomenal as the star of this film. You know, she has like one of those smiles that just like lights up a room and lights up the screen. And so she, like you as a performer, just because of her presence, you are like let in to Alike's like emotional world, right? And... Like, like this film should have made her as an actor a star. Like I'm mm-hmm. like, I watched this film and I'm like, why, why am I not seeing, you know, she's had, I mean, she's had other work. Like she, you know, she does work as an actor, but, but I'm like, oh my God, like this, she should be, you know, like I, after this film, I'm like, oh my God, please like let her star in more things. Cause she is so great. Um, yeah. So good. Also, I mean, like I'll, I'll get into, you know, actual like important non-superficial stuff, but at a parody, it was 33 when this movie came out, playing the 17 year old yeah. Alike. And I'm like, you could have told me she was 15. Holy and shit, I would have bought it. Yeah. 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 I, it's yeah. one of those Whoa. examples of, like, I didn't find out she was that age until I looked her up on Wikipedia afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, she's like practically my age. Um, because, you know, like, yeah, like, you know, we, we make fun of, oh, 90210, you know, watching that mm-hmm. is because, like, all those actors were like 30 or whatever. But this, I totally bought it. Like, I totally yeah. bought yeah. her in that in that role. Um, Just phenomenal performances by everyone uh-huh. in this. And I mean, as as angry um, and as sad as Kim Wayans makes me at, in this movie as um, as Alike's mother, still just such uh-huh. a phenomenal performance uh-huh. by her. Um, and Pernell Walker as Laura. Got to give a shout out to my man, Rob Morgan. I always love seeing that dude, even when he's absolutely fucking horrible, you know, (laughs) or playing an absolutely horrible uh, character on screen. But this film, I'm so glad that we're starting our, you know, um, spotlight on um, Black filmmakers this month with this film. Because for one thing, one of the like constant criticisms of, you know, um, queer media that comes out is how much of it is just overwhelmingly white you know, and is, you know, given to us through a white lens. And so like, we need to be, you know, supporting and showcasing more work like this about black queers, but also this film, it's so large and yet it's so small at the same time. You know, it is so particular. Carol, when you talked about how like, there's this real like tangible feeling to it that utterly convinces you of its authenticity you know, um, it is it is so specific and yet it yeah. manages to convey, you know, this larger notion of like how, you know, like young gay kids often like come to learn about themselves and how yeah. they can navigate and 
in oh. a in a world that asked them to minimize themselves or change themselves. Like it's it's yeah. it's just an incredible achievement in the way that like her story is so particular and yet I don't want to use the term universal, right. but oh. you know, it really, you know, it's a it's such a real feeling yeah. movie. I mean, I don't I wouldn't I do not in any way want to diminish like the specificity and the the the, mm-hmm. the blackness, like the quintessential blackness of this film because mm-hmm. it absolutely has that. But I have to, but at the same time, like there were, of course, ways, and I think this is perfectly legitimate and understandable and valid, that I, as a trans person who, when I was younger, knew that my parents would never accept that I was trans and could feel that, just that thrumming pressure in the family, in the dynamics of the family in which I was growing up, like the, the family dynamics in this film like are they're so complex they are so specific mm-hmm. and yet they are so like yeah i mean i think there there is something about them that echoes across you know uh, so many people's um experiences of what it is to be um to be other right to be to be not what to not fit into the mold that your parents and society um you know expects you or pressures you or demands really that you that you fit into yeah. Um, I, I love how you started talking about this, um, Carolyn, the honesty of the film, like that it, it's I, I, that's so important to what this movie is. And all of and like you were saying to all of the filmmaking elements contribute to it. But at the end of the day, like this film, it feels it's it's hard to watch, right? Because it feels so true and it feels so sincere. Uh, and the the conversations, the ways that people talk um, about Alike or Lee, actually, as she wants to be called, sure, um, yes, um, about her and to her was just so real. And like the, you know, there was, a, even though it's surrounding the story, the depth of like her mother and, and you're just like, Gosh. Oh, you, you know, her mother, like my mom's nothing like her, but like, you know, her mother right away, you know, mm, like yes. she's controlling. She wants her daughter to be, um, very, um, stereotypically feminine and like it slowly un- reveals that she is um you know she's trying to control her daughter because she can't control her own life yeah right and, you yeah, know I, like yes i love how like lee on unfo- i mean lee like not like the parents would be approving or accepting of lee regardless but there is a way in which lee becomes a kind of focal point because of the because of all the other surrounding problems in the in the marriage in the relationship between her parents mm-hmm. that they cannot confront or resolve directly um so and i mean this is like an 86 minute film right this film comes in at like under 90 minutes and yet it charts such you know in that time it economically and precisely charts like su- such complex but, uh, uh, but easily understandable you know emotional and psychological territory which is which is remarkable yeah i do also um want to talk about the, the the visuals of this film um is is also i think part of what sets it apart mm. right like it, it's i don't mean to say part twice but um you know it, yes it's a, it's an independent small budget you know whatever but it's it's so beautiful and the creative choices of the the visual choices um the editing choices that are made is what also lends itself to the ability to make something that is pretty short in you know movies nowadays um but with such depth right like it doesn't it doesn't even feel like it's missing anything it just feels like it it contained so much um and there's these moments where like you know near the end when she realizes that um and I guess we do do spoilers, but she's very, very upset because she feels a little like uh, lied to and taken advantage of. And, you know, while the camera is very smooth through the rest of the film, like this one moment, you know, it's handheld. She's walking right. down the street. She's angry. She's kicking trash cans. And the camera is just shaking the mm-hmm. whole time. And it's like you feel it in your soul, <laughs> you know, like you feel it right there of, of how angry and upset she is. And I think that they do such a beautiful job of like you know, the, the tones and the colors and, um, and the framing to just show how like trapped she feels right in the, like the darkness of the club, the, like the angles in which they're shooting her in, um, you know, the, the scenes where, you know, she's on the bus and she's changing and like, she takes off, like, you know, 
all of the stuff around clothing in it, I think d- it did so, so much mm-hmm. to tell this story because like <clears throat> she's trying on different things throughout yes. the whole movie, right? Like she's not her friend Laura, even though her friend Laura keeps trying to put her in a particular style of like uh butch lesbian, right? Like there's a particular um aesthetic that she's going for that that you can tell Lee doesn't really feel like is her necessarily, but she keeps just trying on different things. Um and then you get to the dildo scene and you're just like, oh God, <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> I don't think it's so much that the the butch aesthetic is not for her, is that she doesn't quite know what version of it is hers. And she Oh yeah, that's what feel, I mean. Sorry. You yeah. know, like she I I love um that that scene that you referenced, you know, where at the beginning of the film where she's coming back from the club night and she makes sure that Laura gets off the bus before her so that she can complete her transformation. And it is so magnificently done. Um, and it highlights so much about how gender presentation is dependent upon these seemingly small things to entirely determine how someone is received in the world, right? So it's not as if she like puts on a full face of makeup, puts on a dress, you know, and gets like ball ground kitted out. She simply puts on some small earrings, takes off her, you know, her fitted and her do rag, changes her shirt, and then the transformation you know, back into like a safe gender presentation, as far as her mother is concerned, is complete, you know? And then, you know, yeah, so there's- It is also kind of shocking (laughs) to Mm -hmm. see. Like she she really does look so different, right? Like it it, 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 uh, it just visually was such an- uh, incredible st- I mean it is it's not a storytelling technique it's a part of the story itself but like it it held so much weight yeah and just like you know the the um the way that she is in you know fairly muted or dark colors throughout much of the film and then as more lightness suffuses her decision not to run away but to choose you know we see Lee in you know brighter you know like more jewel tones at the end of the film and then there's that great mirroring done so we see um, Lee on the bus at the beginning, coming back from that club night, you know, with that very melancholy, you know, and blues and greens, you know, at night on the bus. And then at the end, leaving on the bus, head again against um, the window of the bus, but wearing like this bright yellow. Oh, totally. Um, Which also I was like, she ain't taking a bus from fucking New York to Berkeley. Are you kidding well, me? I think but it's like to the <laughs> airport. Done it. I think it's probably. I've done it. <laughs> yeah. I took that three day trip and it was not Ooh. fun. Mm-hmm. That's um, how it is. Yeah. So I, I thought like um a lot of the like the her efforts at changing her clothing is and and the secrecy of it is both her being like not feeling like she has and does not have the space to explore like you know, her, her quote unquote true self, right? Like, you know, in high school, a lot of us, you know, tried on all kinds of different like attitudes and music and clothing. And like, it's kind of a time traditionally, I guess, when you try to figure out like what your interests are and you go all over the place. Right. But she has to do it in secret. So she's constantly like getting to school and changing her clothes at school and then having to change them again to go back home, which, which I've done not for this reason, but I definitely had to like hide some of this shit I was mm-hmm. wearing, uh, because I, it was definitely not acceptable in my home. Um, but like, you know, when the strap on, I think was a really important moment and it's funny, but also like, but it's not like, it's, it's, it's very serious that like, this is, she, she's being told that she needs to like be tougher. Right. I think that the, um, the 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 language in the film was like, yeah, you know, she might be cute, but, you know, she needs to be a little bit harder. Yeah. And so being yeah. harder means that she needs to, like, you know, look a certain way and feel a certain way. And so she's like, OK, I'm going to, like, wear a strap. And she does. And she fucking hates it. Right. And she like she feels constricted by it. And, you know, it's just another example of her being stuck in. Right. Uh, like her her trying on different things and nothing feeling right. But I think crucially, part of what makes her uncomfortable about this strap is that it's white. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not just that, like, it's the wrong size. Like, oh, my gosh, can we talk in the bonus about getting properly fitted for shit? You know, and like not just having your friend go off and buy these things for you unless that's literally the only way that you can get them. But again, you know, like 
this is something that she clearly she's been thinking of before because when she and Laura have that conversation, she's like, hey, I need you to get something for me. And there's that funny, you know, conversation where Laura's like, what, what? And then, you know, figures out what she's asking for. Clearly, this is a conversation that um, that they've had before. But the impetus, you know, the rush to do it is based upon, you know, um, Mika played by Afton Williamson, you know, saying like, oh, yeah, you know, she'd be cute if she was a little bit harder. You know what I found so interesting in that scene, um, those girls in the high school is how much just in that brief scene you see the 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 way that like um traditional gender presentation or like you know popularity or pretty status i don't want to necessarily say privilege but status you know gives you freedom to say and do certain things because it then you know um prepares us for what happens with bina right because bina mm-hmm. can then you know initiate intimacy with Lee and then be like, I'm not gay, gay. Yeah. I'm just playing around. Right. And And this is something that's fairly safe for her to do as someone who identifies as not gay, gay, as someone who's very pretty, you know, someone who's got the love and acceptance of her parents in a way that Lee doesn't have access to. If Lee were to to behave in the exact same ways, um, she would not be as accepted for saying that. And she knows that. And, and God, like this film really makes you feel Lee's anguish in the wake of that morning and that, that, oh. that, you know, encounter with Bina, that realization that what had happened the night before meant one thing to her and something com- right. completely different to Bina. And I think it's just like that, that feeling Lee has because, you know, she's not getting love or validation at home from her parents. She's not, you know, able to find like love and validation in any, you know, romantically in the world. Um, like just that, 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 you know, she, she goes home and she's just like curls up on the floor and she's just sobbing. And you just feel that anguish of like wondering, like, will, when will I ever be seen and loved for like who I am? And I mean, I do like that this film, we do see a larger community like through, I Mm -hmm. think, um, largely through like Laura and, you know, through the club and, and all of that, which, you know, um, is great. I, I also love the way that through Laura, we, you know, the film touches on things like the um the, the economic marginalization and risk that a Yo. person, you know, takes uh by by being, you know, by living authentically as as a queer person or or sometimes does. I mean, so she Laura's living like with her sister and because her mom has kicked her out, and there's bills piling up, and there's so many bills to which they just say let it ride like they Mm -hmm. because they cannot pay the bills. And so like, I mean, yeah, I just really appreciated this film. You know, it it, it's 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 trying to touch on all of like the socioeconomic realities, the the social like the social ostracism and, you know, being marginalized or or, yeah, just ostracized. Like all of these things um, are, are, are present in the film. Oh, like Laura, the way that she exists it's at the intersection of multiple marginalizations. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's that scene, you know, with her and her sister deciding, like, we can pay half on this. Right. We can pay two thirds on that. Like, oh, that's a conversation that like that's real. You oh, know, yeah. Sure um, but then the one that really hit me was how after her night out hanging with her friends, um, she has someone back to the apartment. And she's like, OK, my sister gets back at six. So you got to be out of here by then. Woman, you know crashes out on the couch behind her. And then Laura opens up her books to start studying, you know, yeah. for the GED. And I was like, this is so real. The work that it takes some people just to survive, just to get by, to get a little bit of something is inconceivable to people who don't have to, you know, like navigate a tough world in that way. To, you know, be thinking like, okay, I'm 17, 18, whatever years old, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I can, you know, go to school or get my GED, but I'm also working as much as I can to put food on the table to keep the lights on at the same time that I'm trying to like just live, you know, as a young person and embrace life. It was just like that hit me so much the way she just like she's shrouded in darkness. There's just that one spotlight on the book and she simply gets down to work. Woo. Yeah. I um I want to talk briefly about the harassment scene in the liquor store. Hello. Um because this is where we we get more notified or like understand more about the father 
ignoring um, or, or like refusing to accept that his little girl that he loves and has a really lovely relationship with sort of um, yeah. is is queer. And, mm -hmm. you know, it re his his friends being homophobic um, reinforces to him like it can't be this way, like this cannot happen around me. And, you know, the scene involves a like a, a like a, I guess, visibly queer, whatever that fucking means, um, woman coming into the store. And one of the dudes is like, yo, you go by sir or miss, sir or miss. Um, and like, you know, he calls her a he, she dyke um, and just all of this like really offensive stuff. And it was so um, I don't know. It just reminded me a lot of like what. So my first partner in high school was uh, was pretty butch and we like she constantly got called sir or was like yelled at when she would go into the women's restrooms and um you know it's just like a she, you know she just because of the way she dressed and had short hair you know and like it's it's such a part of your life that you have to deal with and I feel like we understand this conversation a little bit more especially with like uh, the popularity of of trans stories coming forward around the around these issues but like that everywhere you go, you're constantly like, I think this was important, not only for the father, yeah. but also as like storytelling of like existing in the world, looking differently than you, than society has deemed you to look like it means you're constantly under everyone's scrutiny. And there's always the risk of violence. There's always, um, uh, there's always the chance of, of, you know, uh, of judgment and, and harm. And I think that this scene did a lot um, to show, you know, not just the day to day of dealing with your family, but like that it, the day to day of dealing with the world. And it was so this film, I, I loved every minute of it, but there was a certain little nugget of anxiety um, that I carried throughout because we are so accustomed to um, seeing like trauma um, mm. perpetrated against queer people on screen that I was just waiting for it. And when we do have like lashing out of violence, it's, you know, I think crucially like within the home um, that it occurs, it's not out on the street. But after that scene with, again, Rob Morgan, who I love playing socks, the asshole in the liquor store, I was so afraid, you know, like, okay, Lee is going to get clocked going in or out of that club and something horrible is going to happen. And just the, the way that like, that danger and that threat exists for everyone um, in, in that world, you know, that you never know who's going to see you. And so um, earlier when uh, Lee is introduced to Bina and her mother outside church and Bina's like, oh, yeah, you know, like I've seen you at school. And, you're, and I was like, oh, shit, what is yes. she going to reveal? You I know? was so freaked just out like, by exactly, that. <laughs> just the fear, the constant fear um, that you have to that you have to walk through the world carrying um and so that's why those scenes of like Laura with her friends were so comforting because just the the presence of those other people around to witness and protect and surround each other you know offers maybe an illusion but certainly a sense of protection um from from the dangers of the world but yeah i mean i felt like i was walking a tightrope i never knew when there was going to be just like you know an eruption of like hardcore homophobic violence in this. It, just like people walk through the world, never knowing when they're going to be targets. But it, it, but it, that is all true. But I also, I love how this film knows the, the more subtle pain of mm -hmm. the, the, like of the, the, the subtle kind of erasure or dismissal or evasion. And so, you know, the father who we see in that liquor store scene, you know, with his, with his friends, you know, then, at home, right, like, there's a scene where Lee, you know, I mean, because, yeah, Lee loves her dad, and they, you know, they do, like, under certain conditions, they have uh, what, you know, what could be called a good relationship. So Lee, like, you know, tries to, like, open up a bit to 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 her dad and, and starts talking about, like, what if this person likes you and, you know, this and that and that, you know, and, and the dad just has to go and he knows exactly on some level consciously or not he knows exactly mm -hmm. what he's doing when he 
when he kind of cuts Lee off, he's like, hey, what's his name? You know, I'm going to like mm-hmm. look him up in the system or because he's a cop, you know, or whatever. And and then from there goes on to to sort of like this kind of acknowledgement almost that Lee is gay, but that we're not going to talk about it by saying, oh, um, so there's this gay club, this gay women's club or whatever. You don't know anything about that, do you? And like the, with the undertones being very clear, like. You know, it's this it's this feeling and you get it, get it in both parents in this film that that they cannot accept the idea of their daughter being gay because somehow that would be like some kind of shameful reflection on them or something like something that they just can't face. Um, obviously, um, Audrey's the mother's um, uh, refusal to acknowledge uh, Lee's sexuality and Lee's identity is is tied up in in her faith like in her religion and so she at one point like she deploys the fa- the phrase early in the film she deploys the phrase like god doesn't god doesn't make mistakes um which like and as like as soon as she said that i made a little note because i, I immediately was thinking about how well that phrase can be deployed to mean two completely <laughs> oppositional right. things right like audrey is saying like all like Audrey basically means by that, like all men are, you know, all people assigned male at birth are cisgender straight men. All people assigned female at birth are cisgender straight women. You know, maybe they don't really know it, but that's like what they are. And if they think otherwise, they're confused because God doesn't make mistakes. And right. so I was so glad when Lee turned that phrase around later in the film and said, tell mom she's right. God doesn't make mistakes. Meaning like, you know, I am who I am intrinsically. Like God, if God made me, then God made me who I am. Um, but oh my God, like the pain uh, in that final, the last thing Audrey says Ooh. to her is I'll be praying for you. And she does it in that yeah. way, that kind of like sanctimonious, smiling kind of, emotionally detached way that she uh, couldn't even tell her daughter she loved her like yeah fuck off i mean which is but it's sadly uh, like a reality right right? exactly like it is so true like the way that parents that some parents particularly you know if they like can just kind of like disconnect and like look down on on their own children from this place of of you know yeah this like sanctimonious place it's it's so oh it's so it's so painful and it's so hurtful and and this film just nails it with that final scene yeah i i wanted to point out that this film came out in 2011 Mm -hmm. that like i I, and i think that that's important because it's not like we are drowning in um you know black queer (laughs) films and stories by any means but we have seen the media landscape change And I just kept thinking about how like this film came out in 2011 and how like profound that is in that in that moment when we didn't really have, you know, there were very few like stories like this that are getting through that are getting funded that are getting made and how um, remarkable it is that this this did. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up, Anita. So at the time that we're recording this, um, the Sundance Film Festival is still going on. It's happening virtually this year, 2021. One of the panels that I checked out was called um, Barbed Wire Kisses Redux. And it is the it was the 30th anniversary of um, a panel done in 1992 called Barbed Wire Kisses. And it was all about new queer cinema. And it was absolutely fascinating. And if you have the chance to check out the recording, um, I suspect it will be made available, even if you didn't get a Sundance pass. Um, But you have a chance it'd be because it's it's done in two parts. And so she uh, the the moderator had several people who were on that original panel, like Isaac Julian, or I think Greg Araki was on the the first panel. Um, uh, Lisa Cholodenko, you know, Rose Troke, whatever. And then the second part is is a lot of newer filmmakers. Um, Cheryl Dunye took part. Oh, nice. And what's yeah, what's what's really interesting about it is the way that they talk about how, you know, this this label new queer cinema arose in the early nineties and how like that, the type of independent film that was being made um, not necessarily only, you know, in New York or in major urban centers, but a lot of it concentrated there in these artistic communities. It, it, 
it wasn't that they were meant to be um, consumed by small audiences, but there simply were not the distribution networks available. And so I wonder if this film had been made in, you know, 1994, it might have been something that like I heard about in a college class, but never had the opportunity to see because there was no Netflix. There was no Amazon Prime. You know, fuck Jeff Bezos. But, you know, um, <laughs> I didn't live in a town where there were, that showed, you know, independent films or whatever. So much of what we can embrace now um, in, you know, queer media is is available. To, it simply was not available back then. Um, and so, yeah, like... I, I am so excited that we're seeing more of these stories, but I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm glad that we're doing this salute to Black filmmakers throughout this month, because I think there's a lot of stuff out there that maybe people have heard of, but never got to see when it came out. And it's like, if the opportunity presents itself, there are these wide, vast rivers of amazing work that you could be checking out, blowing your mind with. Yeah, totally. But yeah, check out that panel if you can. It's called Barbed Wire Kisses Redux. Um, and it's it happened at Sundance a few days ago. And like I said, I suspect they'll put the recording up so that um, the general public can check it out. Nice. Um, I was also thinking about how we have we have gotten more queer films and, and representations in the media. Um, and that I think there is a sense for those of us who are older like and went through this stuff and like today our friends and us are having children and like raising those children to you know if they're if they're queer or trans or whatever they c- could be whoever they want to be and that they'll be loved and accepted by their families right and i'm watching this happen with my friends and, and their children and so i think it's easy a, a little bit easy i guess i don't know this might be um privilege talking, but that to forget how like this story is still real and still happens for a lot of people, right? That it's not. Oh yeah. Well, there, oh, well, there of is, course. Yeah. you know, mm-hmm. like there, there is like, I don't want to erase the fact that there is a, a bigger acceptance of queer folks than there was, than there was before. Right. Like right. It, and, on oh, a God. wider scale, yeah. but that for sure. And like, that's great and important, but also oh. like there are still people who oh. are hiding the way yeah. they dress and oh. who are afraid to talk to their parents. And, I mean, there's, um, yes. And, and that we even, coming out is even a thing that has to happen, like, right? There's, that, yeah. Like, the default is still very much yeah. um, cis and and um, and heterosexual. And so, you know, I, I the fil- this film was beautiful and amazing and incredible and hard and really still relevant, you know? Absolutely. Like, there's, there's such a danger in looking at, like, the, the you know the improved say media landscape and thinking okay well those issues are in the past like I mean like of course as a trans person I know that there are you know trans young people growing up in you know all over this country in families where they know they have to live in 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 secrecy that they can't speak their truth because they would never be accepted or embraced and and, and I mean right now like legislation, you know, in, you know, there's like in multiple states is there's, there's an incre- even an increased push lately um, in anti-trans legislation. So like to think that um, obviously like in pride is not about a, a trans person, but the issue of like, a, of, of not, not adhering to um, gender conformity is very, very much a, a part of this film. And, you know, yeah. I mean, so yeah, like, we these battles are hardly, uh, you know, in the past, like they are they are very much alive today. Yeah. I am, um, you know, obviously, I feel very strongly that the media is an important force for um, progress. Right. And that um, representations mm-hmm. in the media, um, if they hold certain values, can help us be better people to each other. Right. Mm-hmm. Um but it, th- this conversation is making me think about um, a, a part of Susan J. Douglas's book, Enlightened Sexism, which came out many, many years ago. I think I read it in college, um, where she talks about how there is, has been an increase in, at the time um, and, and now even um, there's an increase in like the media representation of female judges and female lawyers and doctors and like all of these women in positions of power. 
and how like that's not necessarily actually reflected <laughs> in our society. And so like, does it make like it kind of makes us think that women hold more power than they actually do because of the over um, representation of those roles yeah. in media. And I remember like even as I'm saying this now, like I remember reading that and being like, but OK, like I just I always felt a little uncomfortable about that analysis and I couldn't quite nail it. But because like it's in conflict with the like if you see it, you can be it kind of mentality. Right. Which I've also never really liked very much. So I think that when we talk about like the media impact and media influence on us, you know, stories like Pariah, like th this isn't this is um this isn't a story about like you can dream it, you can be it kind of thing. This is a like a, a reality of a life and like that I'm sure a lot of people can see a reflection of themselves in to some degree and their experiences in. Um, but also I bring this up because we are talking about how like, but there are so many more stories now about like happy queer folks and like that's fucking great. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like that's wonderful that we have that, but we can't forget that like it's not, yeah. we're still living in a really terrible state <laughs> for yeah. a lot of people, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh, I mean, I, I think like the issue of, of representation, like aspirational representation is definitely something that needs to be unpacked. But, you know, before we wrap up, I do want to talk about, um, again, the importance of why we're doing this, this spotlight on black creatives during this month, not that we're going to confine, <laughs> you know, our, our analysis of these kinds of films to the month, the short month of February, but that there is there is a benefit to um, reminding people to widen um, their their media consumption um, libraries. But it, like I said, before we wrap up, I do want to talk about one of the things that is so fantastic about this movie, um, again, is how specific it is. It's set in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Um, and it is so vitally, um, inherently Black in all of its cultural references um, and its touchstones. So everything from, you know, Lee um, being told to wrap up her hair at night, removing her shoes when she comes in the house, the language, but also the way in which Black women are presented as, you know, objects of desire for other Black women. There is something so utterly convincing about the gaze in this film being assumed to be um, a, a, a black gaze um, that will understand the language that is in being employed, the card game that's being played, the fashion choices that are being made, the music choices that are being made, um, the the kinds of relationships and dynamics between people. You know, the fact that you know. Um, like that, that scene in the liquor store with um, Lee's father, the liquor store owner, dumbass socks, you know, <laughs> like these kinds of conversations. Um, it's not that they don't happen uh, in other cultures, but just the particular flavor of it, you know, um, as with the rest of the movie is so quintessentially of this time, space and people. Um, and so, yeah, just shout out to D. Reese. Phenomenal work. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that's such an important part of I. I yes, there was something in this movie that I kept being like, what does that mean? <laughs> and I can't remember what it is now. Was it, it was and like you were a, like, can I ask Ebony or can I not ask? Ebony? I don't What is I don't worse? Think, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that did pass through my head, but I think it was a queer, a queer reference that was, I didn't understand. Was it AG? Oh. They use the term he, AG yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. In this oh, yeah. It just means like, you know, a butch girl. Like, it seems like aggressive, aggressive girl. Oh, um, I never heard like that butch. before. I'm surprised I've never heard that before. Anyways. Yeah, that was it. That was the one I didn't. <laughs> there you go. And, and I didn't text you, Ebony, to be like, hey, hey, black <laughs> friends. <laughs> Good, because I would have screenshot it and then been like, uh, Courtney, I mean, can I, you please let's be post honest. this in the show notes? Let's be honest. I have definitely done that to you before, but I, I, I know that's what I'm saying, time. you know, like, and I save those. I've saved those for your trial. Oh, thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. buddy. All right, y'all. Um, Please watch this movie. Uh, it's just remarkable in, in so many ways. And um, we'll be right back. Hey, friends. Thanks for listening to FFR. If you enjoy our weekly conversations about the intersection of feminism and pop culture, consider hopping over to patreon.com slash femfreak and joining our podcast community. You can get access to exclusive bonus episodes, 
join our friendly Discord server, participate in polls to help decide topics for future episodes, and more. Plus, you'll be helping us keep bringing FFR to the virtual podcast airwaves. Visit patreon.com slash femfreak today. What's now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Um, who's got a freak out? Carolyn, I think you have one. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, I feel like I haven't talked about a game in a while. So, um, you know, and I've been in a bit of a rut, actually, when it comes to games, because I don't know, it's just hard. It, like, I mean, in one of those windows or I have been in one of those windows where, like, nothing I play feels particularly exciting or new or fresh. And I was looking for something that would just kind of invigorate me a little bit when it comes to games, like remind me that, oh, yeah, games can be like games can feel like fresh and and original and, you know, which is, you know, it's rare to come across such a game. Um, but um, so I played recently a game that actually came out in the later part of last year, but I only played it um, at the start of this year. And the game is called Paradise Killer. And this is such, in my mind, such an original, such a breath of fresh air on on like multiple levels. And um, it's difficult to sur- summarize why, what makes it that way. But I, but when I say that I'm talking aesthetically, like in terms of how the game looks and sounds and in terms of the world that it, that it offers you. So um, in short, it's a kind of, who done it investigative game where you there's a you know there's been a murder and you have to investigate the murder and you know figure out who you know who the guilty party or parties are and then kind of convict them at this trial which is not anything particularly like new for a game to do but the world in which this game takes place is so refreshing because it's it, it, it it's it's not it's it's a you know it's definitely like a sci-fi fantasy game but it's not a sci-fi or fantasy um, that borrows from the same kinds of influences that so many other games and other media borrow from. It's not fantasy in the sense of like Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, right? It's not sci-fi in the sense of like Star Wars, you know, or Star Trek or anything like that. It's really very original. It's a world, it's like, it takes place in a world where uh, like these, this, People, this, this group of people that's like trying to resurrect gods. And um, anyway, as you play the game, you you learn all about the power dynamics and the personalities of these the individuals on this council. And they're fantastic characters, which really helps make the game come alive, too. They have names like Crimson Acid and Dr. Doom Jazz. And they're just these like larger, <laughs> these like larger than life characters that are, you know, again, are not like um the characters that uh, that you usually encounter in a game. And so, like, at first, this game was kind of dizzying to me in the sense of, like, or disorienting, because I'm like, I do not understand the logical underpinnings of this world. This is not, like, any world that a game has ever thrust me into before. I do not understand what the fuck is going on. But, like, as you play it, you kind of come to understand it better and better. And and it's like, you don't have to understand it completely. Like, it's it's okay to kind of just let this experience kind of wash over you and to just be in its world. Um, but it really cultivates a, a feeling. Um, you know, the feeling I would say is, you know, to me, it's it, it has sort of the pleasant feeling of like being in an empty shopping mall or like there's a, there's a pleasant like isolation to its world. Its world is of just tremendous material excess. And, you know, it's, it's very ostentatious and it feels all feels very like, all ideologically empty and there's definitely political critique embedded in it of like a fucked up power dynamics and you know the the masses being exploited by these privileged few to maintain their very comfortable lifestyle um yeah so just a, a, re- a really interesting breath of fresh air that also works as a pretty interesting mystery that is fun to kind of put together the pieces of as you progress through the game so um i was really pleased to play such an original game to kind of kick off my 2021 and, um, you know, and I hope to hope to find similarly original invigorating games um, to play as the year continues. Carol, can I ask a question? Yeah. Potentially pathetic question. Hmm. Is it this sort of game that 
I could play. <laughs> yeah, um, yes. you know what I mean. I, by yeah, that? I, yeah, I, okay. it is. I would say, like, and, and here's the thing, though. Even I, even I, the quintessential gamer. Um, like there were a few <laughs> points where I looked up. You know, like, I what am I supposed to do next? You know, um, mm-hmm. uh, online because I, you know, I knew I wanted to kind of see the whole story play out, and I wasn't really sure. You know, I knew that I was like missing something. So mm-hmm. if you're willing, you know, if you're willing to consult a guide or look things up online occasionally, then I would say yes, absolutely. Like, there's no, there's no um, action challenges in the game. There's no way to like lose or die or fail. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, it's purely mostly about just running, you know, running around an island, talking to characters, and you're yeah, you have this like computer that that kind of collates all the evidence for you and and kind of nudges you in the right direction. So so yeah, it's purely purely investigation and ex- and exploration. Okay. This this seems like something I can play and it sounds very interesting. Yeah, I always worry um because people s- describe stuff and it sounds awesome mm. and then I, you know, look it up and I'm like I'll I it will take too much learning right. <laughs> for me yeah. to, you know, <laughs> figure out how to man- even maneuver a spot in this game. So yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so I, as Ebony mentioned, the Sundance Film Festival is currently happening at the time of this recording. Actually, it's going to be happening when this comes out. Anyways, yep. um, I watched a film at Sundance that premiered called The Pink Cloud. And, oh boy, it is a lot. It is a lot. I, I highly recommend it. Um, I can't imagine it won't get picked up quickly for distribution. Um, it's a Portuguese film by director Luli Gerbes or Gerbes. And it <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm avoiding like saying what it is. Um, it is it is so it is about a pandemic. Mm. It's about a pandemic. And it is so eerie because she wrote it in 2017 and filmed it in 2019. And as they were editing it during 2020, they were like, this is too real. Like Mm. we are literally editing scenes that we are living at this moment. So in the film, instead of it being like a, um, a contagion that is passed or a virus that is passed between people, um, these pink clouds appear over the entire world. And if you step into them or if you go outside at all, um, you will die in 10 seconds. And so you literally cannot leave the building in which you are in. So if you are buying groceries, you are stuck at the grocery store with everyone else that's at the grocery store. Oh, my God. Um, and so you're stuck in the house with whoever is with you or not with you. Um, and <laughs> like, I just, I kind of don't want to give away too much. So I'm, I'm going to maybe not talk too much about it because I, I really want folks to have the opportunity to like watch it unfold as I did. Um, I will say though, because of that conceit, as soon it was, as soon as it was over, like I stepped outside. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, "Thank God you can go outside." Like I went and bought groceries, and like you know, the the person at the butcher shop was like, "You know, how's your day?" I was like, "I just watched this fucking movie." <laughs> he was and like, they were like, "Okay, okay lady." <laughs> I was like, "I'm really thankful that I can be in this grocery store right now." Um, so yeah, it, it's just it. it it is so odd how much it captures of our like experience today, um, you know, with with its own conceits. But like the difference between being stuck in a house with someone versus being alone, um, you know, there, there's a lot to it. And it's I think it was really, really well done. And um, it just, you know, it, it's a little hard to watch, to be honest, even though I think it's a pretty remarkable film. So I hope it gets picked up for distribution soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so folks can can check it out because it it's very timely, <laughs> even though I'm sure it wasn't intended to be. Wow. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, hey, you might have a freak out. And if you do, you can submit it at feministfrequency.com slash freak out. That's F-R-E-Q-O-U-T. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. Join us next week as we talk about Julie Dash's landmark film, Daughters of the Dust. If you are a Patreon uh, supporter, you can listen to our bonus episode that is exclusively for you. 
And um, yeah, that's it. Our show is engineered by Rob Perra. Carrie Stimson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks so much for listening. Bye, Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everybody.